I see all colleagues from yesterday here. I'm happy to see you again. We are very, very pleased to welcome you at our third session. And as we promised and uh, announced yesterday, the session will be devoted to, the em to emotions. So Lena today will speak about emotion from the part of you, how we can release our emotion that hijacked us, our states of calm, and also how we can engage supportive relationships with others using techniques in empathy. So this is, it sounds very great, this subject. Personally, I'm really, uh, I can't wait. So, I would like now to give a floor to, to Leonard because we don't have a lot of time. So I don't want to, 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 to take more time of this precious moment with our coach, Leonard Luizzi. Please, Leonard, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Maria. Thanks very much. I'm just letting in Sonia here um, and other people that will may come in later on. We're starting a little bit later than, than, than forecasted, but I hope uh, we can get the... Um, the information in for you. So uh, welcome back everyone. If you were here on uh, yesterday and on Monday, or welcome for the first time if you're here for the first time, of course, this is day three, day three of Create Your Comfort at Work. Um, how to cope with changing environments using our own resources, using, using our physicality, our power of concentration, our focus, and uh, using our emotions. And also how to use our resourcefulness, meaning our mindset, the permission we give ourselves to imagine, to desire, to be generous, to decide differently, uh, to create something new. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, I repeat this every time because I think it's uh, very important. And secretly, I want to um, I want this to sink into your subconscious. <laughs> um, create your comfort at work has nothing to do with being comfortable. It has everything to do with living, everything to do with embracing life, its ups and downs, its ins and outs, its, um, its, uh, its wonderful moments, beautiful moments of relaxation and moments of you know, stress. Yeah, It's about recognizing and exercising our own personal power to overcome obstacles, uh, challenges and setbacks, regardless of our environment, regardless of who is in front of us, regardless of what situation it is, um, not only the present situation as it is now, but the situations as they were before, and of course, what we're told the situation is to be. So we're giving ourselves the power and the autonomy, the freedom to decide and to make adjustments to ourselves using our resources and our resourcefulness, yeah? Um, I think about it as building, as cultivating our power on four levels, our phys on the physical level, our physiology, our physical ability to be well, on the mental level, of course, which we, we, we sort of discussed and, and looked at yesterday with our focus, and on the emotional level. Here today, we're talking about emo our emotions through um, supportive relationships, yeah? On a spiritual level as well, which we will cover tomorrow, um, and the spiritual level is basically focusing on our spirit in the, uh, in the broader sense of the term, our enthusiasm, our imagination, and our um, drive and motivation. Uh, in the previous session uh, last year, I mean, not last year, in June, <laughs> before the summer, uh, we experienced uh, emotions, we did the emotional session, and we talked about kinesthetic connection and touch and uh, how this is part of our basic human needs, uh, a need for belonging and contact. And if we were to contact people physically or ourselves physically, I don't know if you remember this, this self-hug that we would do. We did this in June as well, uh, which we'll practice a little bit later. Uh, that gives us a sense of security. Huh? It also fulfills that need, a sense of security. Um, we would... Uh, what, what, first of all, I'd like to ask you, what did you take away from yesterday's session? What, uh, what did you take away? Write that in the chat. Uh, what was, uh, did you have any epiphanies, any thoughts, any comments, any confusion? Uh, what did you take away? I'm going to look at the chat here. Okay, write that in the chat. And while you're doing that, uh, in June, we also covered... Um, 
gratitude, gratitude and practicing gratitude in two different ways. One of them was Ho'oponopono, and the other one was from uh, a statement that um, I discovered on the internet about how to create affirmations for yourself. So the other person doesn't need to be there. Okay. Energy is where we want it to be. Okay. Trying not to focus on what I can't control. Absolutely. From yesterday. Okay. What else did you discover? Focus on positive things. Okay. All actions have positive and negative results. Okay. That's very good. We can use our imagination to defocus. Focus is where we permit ourselves to spend our time and energy. Absolutely. We permit ourselves. And the, the uh, presumption here is that we are in control. We are in the control and whether we focus on the negative or the positive, positive, it's our choice, conscious choice or unconscious choice. And hopefully we're making that more and more a conscious choice. Yeah. Don't internalize the negative. Absolutely. Uh, it's very, um, it's very um, challenging sometimes not to internalize it because we always, we're perfectionists, I think, and we always like to um, do better. Uh, but sometimes we um, beat ourselves up and uh, we don't let go. We don't release. We don't move on from, from what we should do. Okay, a bad situation. Well, we've all had bad situations. Who hasn't made a mistake in their lives? The person, okay, maybe um, raise your hand or raise a, a virtual hand if you, if, you have, um, if you have never made a mistake. Raise your hand at work. Okay, now raise your hand if you've made mistakes at work. And that should be everybody. Okay. Not everyone has raised their hand yet. Well, some people, we're, we're in the presence of some, some real perfectionists here. Okay. All right. That's just kidding. Okay. To be aware of our uh, subconscious focus. An oxymoron, okay, to be aware of your subconscious focus, okay. So uh, an oxymoron, of course, is um, can if because of the fact that it's subconscious, the fact that it's unconscious, can we be aware of it? No, but we can become aware of it. Just like we're not aware of uh, perhaps um, when we're learning a new language, we don't really understand the intonations and the voice and the and the and the uh, pronunciation of a word, but with exposure with the habit of practicing certain things, well, we, get, we become aware of it. We become more aware of it and we become, um, we have an ability to control it and to, to use it as well, yeah? So, so to, become, to want to become aware of your unconscious, I think is, uh, it can be a positive thing. It's not like you should keep all of this stuff um, hidden away. I mean, the opposite of becoming aware is of course, remaining ignorant. And uh, you know what they say about um, the Second World War. Uh, the um, the uh, road to Auschwitz is paved with indifference. So the more we uh, ignore things, we are practicing ignorance in that sense. Huh? And um, I would I would be careful about that. There's certain things we can't, of course, all, always be aware of things, and we need to let go and relax, obviously. But uh, when it comes to uh, our focus, when we want to improve something, of course, we want to take it with two hands and find out as much as we can about it, okay? Any other things that you um, discovered or realized or you know, rediscovered from yesterday? Let's have a look at the chat. Okay, fair enough, nothing else. Fair enough, so today we're practicing and experiencing how can we release our emotions that hijack us, our states of calm, and how we can deal with it, not just by ourselves, but with others, in front of others. When we feel that perhaps um, the trigger was by our environment, by what we're doing, by others saying certain things to us, how can we, how can we deal with our emotions? And how can we amplify and uh, create, construct supportive relationships with others? meaning in front of people, yeah? This obviously means that to test and practice these, some of these skills in empathy, we need to be in front of people to have that uh, feedback and to see if we're um, progressing in, in that area, okay? So before we dive in, let's um, remember what we were doing yesterday, okay? We were trying to focus and defocus. We did those funny focusing games, you know, the hand on your chin <laughs> and the unfolding seven. 
Um, and um, we um, were looking at the fact that, well, we we're, we're trying to experience the fact that we don't recognize things unless we're looking for it. Yeah, there's this uh, statement from uh, Henri uh, David Thoreau. Uh, we only find in the world what we're looking for. And this seems to be really sort of, um, I mean, it's an interesting sort of idea, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not a joke. It really is that. Remember, I mean, I know for myself when I'm, when I'm uh, looking for something, I'm going to find it. When I'm looking for the new car, and that happened to be, I don't know, a, a Skoda or something like that. And um, all I see is Skodas. When my partner was uh, pregnant, all I saw was pregnant women. You know, there's a, a part in the brain called the reticular activating system, whereby if you're seeking something, it will show you all of those things in the environment. Yeah. Who agrees with this? You can raise a hand. Who doesn't agree with it? Put a thumbs down. So we see if everyone's awake. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Flo, Sonia, Andrea, Sonia. Uh, okay. Okay. Come on, wake up. <laughs> okay, good. Fair enough. So um, defocusing, we also learned about defocusing. And so how the two, focusing and defocusing, are recovery states for each one. Yeah. When we're focused, when we're concentrated, when we have this sort of tunnel vision on what we need to focus on, for example, work. We also need time to away from that where we can not just concentrate and focus, literally, but we are defocusing. We are relaxing. Yeah. We are just observing and receiving information but passively, yeah? and how that is a very good recovery for when we are focusing, and vice versa. Yeah? Um, there's this famous uh, quote by Earl Nightingale, uh, the hardest work you'll ever do in life is to focus your mind. And another quote by Tony Robbins, where focus goes, energy flows. And I like to add on, whatever we're focused on, that thing grows. Our focus, the importance of that thing in our life grows. Yeah? So I asked you to remember to write a list of three things that you habitually um, focus on that are outside of your control. So here we are looking at the locus of control, the location of control. When we focus on things that are outside of your control, outside of our control, um, it stresses us because by the fact that we don't have control over it. Yeah? It's important to remember, am I focusing, the question is of course, am I focusing on things that in which I have no power, no control over. I have maybe some influence, but I really can't control it. And how is that making me feel? That was the second question. How does that make me feel? And then from there, if it's a good feeling or a bad feeling, okay, well then what are you gonna do about it? So it comes to the third question, which was, um, if there was one thing or one to three things that I could focus on that could make me feel empowered, that can make me feel, wow, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel that I have control. That makes me feel that I have influence on what's happening. And that there is progress for me or for other people as well. Just like work, people want to work in a place where they feel that their actions make a difference in the system or in other people's lives, yes or no. Okay, so that, that's the focus. When you can see those things, you feel good, you feel empowered. And so we worked on that as well. And you came back with, uh, you went away and you discussed it with your colleagues, yeah? Okay, so today let's get on. Um, let's stand up and shake the body out. Shake it out. <laughs> Excuse me. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Shake it out, shake it out. The shoulders. Let's see. I don't know if I can see everyone. Yep. And the hips. Shake the hips out, shake the hips out, bend the knees, let them bounce a little bit. Oh, take a deep breath. Oh, it's a shame that we don't do this live because then we can go a little bit further in some of the things and we can have fun, a little bit more fun. Huh? The medium is sort of prohibitive in some way. Okay, so there we go. One hand on the belly, feet slightly apart, slightly apart. One hand on the belly, one hand on the chest. Come into contact with yourself. As you breathe, feel the chest rising and lowering or the belly ballooning or receding, whichever breath you like to take. You know. And then now slightly lift the chest in space, a millimeter, just lift it slightly. Raise the hands to the side of your body and place the hands at the back of the head. Oh, this is the position. 
have the eyes on the horizon and you can close your eyes and just try and remember what position does this remind you of? What, what not this position rather, what, what, uh, what does it remind you of? Director. Director, Director. general Director. position. <laughs> Yeah, I, I put that as a, as a joke. <laughs> I'm sure they're working hard as well. Um, but yeah, put it in the chat, write it in the chat. What does that position remind you of? For you personally? Oh, Leonard, it reminds me of when uh, I'm on vacation or, you know, holidays, of course, floating in a pool, fantastic, lying on the beach, confidence, okay. What does it remind you of? What more does it remind you of? Self-satisfaction when the work is finished. Wow, beautiful. Lying on a beach. Okay, wonderful. Now come back into this position. The chest is raised. Satisfaction, beautiful. Okay, arms are here, your eyes are closed, they're on a level. Now try and imagine the most difficult situation that you've been in today or this week, for example. Breathing fully, elbows to the side. Just imagine that. And let go of that in your, in your mind. Let go of the arms and the position. Chat in what, what, what comes to you, what um, your experience of that situation. Andrea writes, peaceful day uh, down at the park, okay. It was less stressful, Luca, really? Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Easy peasy. <laughs> Why is that? I tell you, I found it hard to think of something. Yeah, of course, nothing dramatic. The body will always choose the most positive thing available to it. And so what we're doing with this position is feeding our body and feeding our minds something positive. So whenever you come across a negative situation, your power position may not be this, it may be this one. It may be this one, or it may be something else that, that you think that you feel that resonates with you, that makes you feel very positive and empowered. Use it. Use it in those situations when you need it, okay? It's a tool. It's a tool to use. And I believe it's an important tool because we can easily feel um, submerged and uh, lots of tension, lots of sadness, lots of emotions. And we need something that's for free to pull us out of that. And this for me works. This for me works. Now tell me if you ask me, Leonard, you know, do you use it often? No, not often. I can use it much more often than I do. I can use it in the morning when I wake up and uh, do my affirmations, my, you know, hot water and stuff. I can use it then. Yeah. It helps. It helps a lot. Okay. Somehow I felt the feeling that I can manage the problem. Yeah. We are stimulating hormones in our body, according to Amy Cuddy like testosterone, which is the confidence hormone. And um, this expansive position helps our body remember those expansive positions, you know, when we were on holiday, when we were having fun, when we were feeling empowered. And it was choosing that over the stress. Yeah. Okay, good. So we've done that position. Let's do the condor. Okay, everyone stand up, please. Very quickly, very, very quickly. Shake it out. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got to get rid of this cough. Okay, good. Now, allow the arms to rise just above the ears, above the head, and then lower. Yes, I'll step back a little bit and rising up and then down. Very good. All together now, rising up. And as we rise the hands up, that you can look up to the ceiling. And coming down and breathing in, allow the eyes to rise with the hands. And breathing out. One last time, Anna, very easy, very easy. Gracefully, generously, yes. 
generously yes beautiful wonderful yes so you're carrying yourself with kindness here you're being generous you're not just saying okay do this movement like press that button mm -mm. this has integrity and it's not just what you do it's how you do it the how is very very important it, it's our our secret formula for winning or losing yeah <laughs> whichever way whichever strategy that we have there okay great so we've done the condor just write in the chat how that was for you how did that feel how did that feel for you doing that exercise and if you didn't do it because your camera was closed and you were not very motivated to do it shame on you how was that how did that feel for you how did that feel hey 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 empowering yeah, what other words? Stress release. Okay. Refreshing, relaxing at the same time. It regulated my breathing. Absolutely. Yeah. We're focused on different things. Yeah. Very good. Stress release. All right. Anything else? One. Okay. Very good. So let's just move on. Let's start with the centering technique. This is a technique whereby, for example, if you have emotions, you are being hijacked. Um, by the day or by a moment in the day and you find it very difficult to um, release that tension to um, to balance out those emotions um, oh by the way let's write in the chat what um what are emotions for you personally not the dictionary um, version your version what are emotions for you what are emotions? Let's just start with that, basically. A physical expression of how you are feeling inside. Yeah. Also, things that I feel internally. Yes. A reaction to the outside. Okay. Only? What can connect us or separate us? Very good. Internal reactions of my body to facts and news. Hmm, okay. Okay, what else do we have? What makes me feel alive? Absolutely. Emotions tell you that you're living. Emotions are data, pieces of data. That's what emotions are. And they're data in formation. Yeah? We receive a sensation, we receive a some news, for example, on the telephone, or we see it on the TV or whatever, we interpret this piece of news, meaning that we check it with our memory, our limbic brain, the backlog, the, the library of all these pieces of information stored in our mind, all these experiences that we've had, that we've been exposed to, and we codify it. And we say, that is whatever experience, as good or bad, and then we put an emotion to it. So that first emotion may be anger, frustration, an internal reaction which influences changes in my mood, often as a result of something I hear, read, see, sense. Very good. So you sense something inside and also you can sense something from the outside too. Informate, um, rather, emotions are, are pieces of information for us. Yeah, a messenger. Pieces of information for us that tell us certain things, that basically tell us that we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention to, to ourselves. We need to be mindful of something happening to us, that there's a lesson to learn, that there's something to do, that we can love it, we can change it, or we can move away from it, yeah? It gives us an opportunity. Emotions are pieces of opportunity for us to, to come to terms with things that are rising up in us, and to work on things, work on situations and, 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 and feelings that we have. Now, these feelings may be justified or unjustified, I don't know, but it's, it gives us, if you look at it as information, then it helps us to um, take a little bit of distance from our emotions and not live them, not be hijacked from them, but take distance. Here's another technique that we're going to do right now called centering. Um, it's a technique like um, coming from uh, somatic education. Um, and uh, the movement of embodiment, um, notably from Mark Walsh in, in, in England. Um, and uh, it helps us uh, become aware 
and balance our emotions and, and our mind and our thoughts, okay? It's a form of state management. State management is a management of our physiology, um, not of the state, of course, of, of, the, of the government, but um, our physiology, meaning our breathing. And it's a way of regulating ourselves, our, 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 the way we breathe and our emotions and our mind, our thoughts as well. Um, it works to optimize how we are when we're doing something, it helps us manage work. It helps us manage people. It helps us speak coherently. It helps us with interviewing, you know, speaking to our colleagues, dealing with difficult situations. Okay. And so we're going to practice this together. It provides us with a, a, a positive foundational state from which we can do all kinds of things with greater awareness and uh, greater choice. So here we go. Everyone stand up, please. <coughs> <laughs> okay check it out here it is now this is called abc awareness abc awareness a for awareness of our five senses b for balance our balance of our body yeah and c for the core of ourselves being relaxed and the connection with other people abc so let's just go through this. So we can be relaxed, standing up, feet slightly apart, eyes are closed, the eyes are on the horizon, okay? So A for awareness is now just to take stock to sense our awareness, our kinesthetic awareness, meaning, for example, our sense of touch. Now we can start with the soles of our feet, feeling the connection of the floor with our feet. And then we can bring our awareness to our breathing, which is also a kinesthetic state. Yeah. Just observe how you're breathing. Yeah. Bring your attention now to the gustative state, which is the taste in your mouth. If you have been eating or drinking something, maybe there is a remainder of the taste that was there. Just observe the tastes that are in your mouth at this, this time. Let's carry our attention now to the smells that are in the room in which you are in, which you are standing. If there was a smell to be smelled, what would it be? Maybe it's your perfume. Maybe it's the fragrance of the cream, the lotion that you put on. Maybe it's the, uh, the fragrance of the hairspray, for example. Smell all there is to smell. Carry the attention now to the sense of hearing. Yeah? Hear what is in the room, all the sounds that are in the room at this time. Maybe it's the clock ticking. Maybe it's if you have a pet, a pet moving around in the room. Maybe it's just my voice or the sound of your breathing. Carry the attention outside of the room and listen to the sounds that are outside of the room in which you stand. It might be neighboring traffic, our neighbors next door, sounds from the street, birds singing. Now gently open your eyes and receive the light that is in the room. Look at the light, look at the colors the shades of light, rather than the objects, rather than the things in the room. And let your vision be more of a, an open vision, peripheral vision, rather than a concentrated one. A is for awareness, awareness of our five senses. B is for balance. Very gently take your body forward in space, the weight of your body 
onto your metatarsals, the balls of your feet, and then back very gently onto your heels. Cradle yourself, rock yourself forwards and back. Very good. And then in the frontal plane, from side to side, from one foot, allow the weight to pour into one leg and then to pour progressively into another. Yeah. So these movements are very slow and gentle. And it's all about sensing and feeling how the weight is distributed piece by piece from one leg to the other. Exactly, there we go. And then also in the other direction, which is up and down, bend your knees and ankles very gently, progressively, and then straighten. And you may want to rise onto your toes very gently and then lower progressively onto the heels and then bend the knees again. Always with the eyes on the horizon and breathing very deeply. Okay, and then coming down to straight. B is for balance, forward and back, side to side, up and down. C is for the core of your body relaxed, meaning eyebrows, between the eyebrows, the eyes are relaxed, the eyelids are gently closed, the tongue in the mouth is relaxed, the jawbone, the diaphragm, your solar plexus area there is also relaxing, the belly is ballooning, and the pelvic floor, imagine that, that floor that holds everything in, is relaxing gently too. C is also for connection, where we're connecting with the image of someone we love, someone who loves us. It could be a situation as well, a situation that we lived before in the past that, in, that gives us energy, that gives us power, that gives us a feeling of belonging. Just connect with that image for a few seconds. Take a deep breath. And relax. Okay, so very gently, come and write in the chat how that was for you, that centering practice. How was that? How did that feel? Calming, okay. Soft. I feel deeply connected to myself. Relaxing and empowering. And all we're doing is giving ourselves an opportunity, an opportunity to Receive, to be sensitive, to take a break. Feeling of being here, grounding, there's no problem out there. Getting back into our senses. That's why um, our physical sensations are very important. They cannot be ignored or devalued. Uh, we, we need to, in some shape or form, regain contact to ourselves and to other people. And it helps us balance our emotions. Emotional at the end, absolutely. Well, take it easy. Yeah, you know, maybe you need to, you know, take a glass of water, you know, take a drink. Allow those emotions to come up progressively. Progressively, yeah. Relax, relaxing, also disconnecting from work, indeed. So it happens you know, on every level. It helps us relax on every level. It's really good for um, dealing with our emotions. Yeah. First, we deal with our emotions, and then we can deal with the emotions of other people and the situations that are full of contention. Yeah. 
we deal with ourselves first. Or we have this with us and we can perhaps can reduce this into a moment where we can just close our eyes, take a deep breath and start again. Me too emotional at the end when I go through without a person who is far. Okay. So we don't want to put ourselves closer to the edge, whether emotionally or with our thoughts or with our emotions, with our, um, with our feelings. Um, you want to be able to make wise choices. Maybe there are times when we can really experience perhaps emotions that we've been keeping down for a while. Um, but it's not every time we can do that. You know, we need to, we need to um, permit ourselves to release a little, bit, a little bit of emotion, a little bit of unsatisfaction, perhaps slowly, progressively, you know, and not all at once. That, would, that could make it more detrimental than positive for us. You know? Any other thoughts, feelings, um, comments about this technique, about this way of uh, dealing with emotions? Okay, my next question to you is, when do you think you could use this? We took about 10 minutes to, to go through the motions, the awareness of your five senses, the balance of the body, the connection to yourself, to your core, those, those, those flaws in yourself. And then of course, the connection with um, something positive that gives you energy, that doesn't take away energy from you. When could you practice this? In our life in general, more specifically, when during the day perhaps is the question, when during the day, if there was a moment, if there was a, a difficulty, when would you practice it before an important meeting or when closing the work day? Absolutely, absolutely Miriam. In the middle of a bad day, yep. Just before eating, just before the phone call, <laughs> just before the, the moments of contention, just before. The more you practice this, the more you can remind yourself to do it. The more you practice this, the more, you know, like just like anything else, the more you practice, the better you become, you become more skilled. At lunchtime or AM, why not? Why not? Anytime, anytime. And the more you practice it, the more you remember it, it becomes part of your memory, your active memory. And the more you can use that as a resource for yourself when it comes to emotional swings, which we all have. We're human beings. The saying is we're emotional beings having a logical experience. We choose for our emotions and we satisfy our choices and decisions with our logic. We always choose emotionally. You know? So why not, you know, come to terms with that and say, well, look, you know, I'm an emotional being here as well. I do have feelings and I'm going to take care of my feelings. I don't want to ignore them. I don't want to push them away. I don't want to um, allow them to, I don't want to internalize them because when they do become internalized, then I get sick. I want to be able to understand there's a problem here. There's an imbalance. Thanks to my emotions. Thank you anger, <laughs> thank you, sadness, or thank you, frustration, whatever it may be. Thank you, joy, that I can experience something and I can, I can balance it out. I can choose to balance it out. Um, when we feel we need it because we start feeling overwhelmed. Okay, good. Sometimes we can break the pattern. We have an emotion and we need to break our pattern. That's the sort of classical way of doing things, yeah? You have an emotion or you perhaps you see your mom. I see my mom having an emotion. Mom, bah, 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 and I'm jumping around and I'm doing a, sort of like a juggling for her and I'm doing a little dance so she can not think about what she's thinking about, which wells up these emotions of perhaps sadness, but she can change her focus and see something else. But that doesn't negate the emotion. That doesn't mean that um, it won't come back. And so this technique is a way of dealing with it. It's a way of coming, you know, face to face with it and embracing it and allowing it to, you know, thank you, now you can go, yeah. Um, any thoughts, questions, ideas, um, comments, criticisms, all welcome.
Okay, then let us move on very quickly to how to create and engage in and um, support supportive relationships. You know, this is an assumption here, actually, because, you know, maybe I should ask you the question, what percentage of your relationships are supportive? What percentage of all your relationships that you have, let's just say at work, are supportive? Write in the percentage. Uh, for me at work, mm, I work alone. <laughs> so uh, the percentages are not very, uh, perhaps not a very good uh, way of calculating that. But um, people I come into contact with, I would say about, you know, 70%. 95, 50, 80. Okay, too many, unfortunately, too many percentages or too, too high a percentage or too many people. 70%. Try, Christine, try and try and make a, put a, put a number on it. When we measure it, we can manage it. If we don't measure it, it becomes something, well, yeah, there's a lot. And it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't give us um, an ability to, to manage, to control, or to capture it. Yeah. Good question. At work, difficult to say. Privately, a lot, 80% that are supportive. Yeah? So for those of us who are higher up, higher than 50, um, we're going to work on the difference. Yeah? How to perhaps, the tools that perhaps you know already, but perhaps you don't practice so well, or practice so much, rather. Privately, 90%, wonderful, because then you balance out, of course, work. What about work? What about the area where it's not so good? What, are, what is the percent? Of course, it would be 10% there. What is a supportive relationship? It's a good question. What is a supportive relationship for you? Everyone has their own subjective opinion on that. Let's just answer that question, Mirjam's question quickly. What is a supportive relationship for you? For me, personally, it's one where I can speak. I can feel that I'm being heard. And I feel that I can share time with minds, with minds coming together and thinking and focusing on the same thing. Yeah. Being accepted, of course. What else is it? A relationship that lifts you, that doesn't take you down. Where you come out of it feeling positive. For me, someone with whom I can exchange and learn from and uh, therefore grow, okay? Okay, a relationship where I can give and receive something. Okay, that's, that's interesting, Luca. Where my opinion counts and the communication is good. Okay, a good communication. Where my opinion counts. Okay, let's flip this a little bit. What do you contribute to your relationships which are not so supportive? How do you contribute to them? Yeah. Someone once said to me, yeah, uh, your relationships, Leonard, um, it's not what you can get out of it. It's what you can give. That was a, a, an epiphany moment for me. Oh, really? Way back when. Someone I can share my feelings with and who makes me see things positively. Okay. And then what do you give? What would you give? In work, acknowledgement of what I do, feedback is important. Absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right. But what do you give? In work, okay, in empathy. Yeah, what, what is that empathy? What Respect always, yeah, is that enough? I'm respectful, there you go. Turn my head and I go. <laughs> listening and empathy, okay. What exactly about listening and empathy? To be supportive, relationship, uh, have to be a supportive relation, to the other, how? I know nothing about relationships. I know nothing about empathy. Tell me, show me, how would I do that? Describe to me how I would do that. Be mindful, okay, I have my mind. I'm attentive, attentive to what? To what they're saying. I give feedback, I care about my colleagues and I ask about how they are doing. Is that enough? I listen. How do you listen? By being tolerant. Yeah, who can get, also get your toes trodden on in his or her shoes, okay? It's understanding um, my being able to, uh, able to put, herself in my, put myself in her shoes, okay? Put myself in her, in her shoes, okay? I was very, I say that my colleagues, I say my colleagues, I can help them when they are very busy, okay? Fair enough. All of these responses are very, very good. Yeah, showing respect. But let's get down to the nitty gritty. When we speak about communication, we're speaking about communication on three levels, verbal, visual, 
and vocal, yeah? What percentage is verbal, generally speaking? 10%, close enough, 30%, 7%. Stefania has it correct, 7% according to Meheraban, Meher, Meheriaban, a name like that, who did the research. What percentage is vocal? What percentage is vocal? Meaning the tones of the voice, the rhythm, the sharpness. 15%, 30, 15, 10, 38%, 38%. And the rest 55 is, is visual. So if, for example, Anna is speaking to me and I'm like, <laughs> or I'm like, uh, oh yeah. How am I showing that? How am I showing respect? How am I showing? How am I delivering this? I haven't said a word. The ninety-three percent nonverbal counts a lot. So we have to be present with people. We have to be present with them, and we have to be with them, not just looking them in the eye all the time, but looking them in the eye, listening to them. And listening is a demonstration. Huh? Listening is not just, yeah, I'm listening. Oh, yeah, hear what you said. I said, you said this, 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 and this, and this. I'm correct. No, that's not listening. Listening, that's part of listening. The other part is demonstrating, demonstrating that you are listening. And so that's a way, just that alone, can build a supportive relationship. Animals feel it. Children feel it. When you're there, you're not directing the conversation. You're just there listening. Empathy is also reformulating what they say. They may say, oh, yeah, I had a really hard day today. You did, for example, you, or you had a hard day today. There's an author called Chris Voss, who was an ex-CIA, I think, FBI agent. And he was always in negotiations and he's quite famous. He's on YouTube. I bought his book a few, a year or two back or two years back. Very interesting. He talks about tactical empathy, tactical empathy, but it's the same recipe. It's the same science, reformulating, being with them is first, listening, being present, deciding to yourself, I want to listen to this person and I want to hear them out. What they have to say perhaps doesn't make me feel good because I'm a sensing feeling person and I, I feel affected by that, but I'm going to give them that space, that foyer where I can receive them and see how they feel. That's number one. Second is I can reformulate what they tell me. I can, I can, I can perhaps say a word. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, and help them to continue speaking. What else can we do? Maybe you can put it in the chat. What other things can you can you do to um, help the conversation? Smile. Of course, if it's the right, if it's appropriate, you don't want to smile when they're oh my god. Da, da, da. No. You want to be concerned if they're concerned. You want to smile if they tell you a joke or they they want to give you some news to share, some good news to share. Rephrase, okay, yeah, ask questions. Simple questions, how questions. How is that? What, okay, what exactly? The why I would leave right to the end. You'll find out the why, but you don't wanna go why. Why did you do that? No, how, how did that happen? Let them explain. Be authentic, yeah, okay. That means also, very good, that means also when you don't have the time, you can say, look, I want to give you the time and attention that this issue deserves. I don't have the time right now. See what I did? I spoke about what they want, then I spoke about what I wanted. I know that this situation is going to take a little bit more time. And I want to give you that. But right now, I've got some other things to do. Can we make a time tomorrow at precisely what time? to speak about, is that okay? Would that be okay? As a question at the end. Be mindful of the physical dynamics. If one is sitting, exactly. You don't wanna look at them like this. Oh yeah? 
or be far away from them. Oh yeah, with arms crossed. You know, you want to be with them. If they're telling you things, oh, well, you know, Leonard, blah, blah, blah. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, great. You know, you want to be in rapport with them. It's called pacing and leading in neuro-linguistic programming. And then, and then you, you guide them in different directions. Okay. Offer an ear to listen to them, a shoulder to cry on, arms to hug them. But what if you don't want to? What if you're not the touchy-feely type? What if you you don't you've you've got enough on your plate, you know? Really, it's like it's coming up there. What do you do? How do you manage that? But yeah, indeed you do. But how? Open questions. How questions are, are for me the best? How did that happen? What do you think you should do? It's an interesting question. What do they think they should do? Then it gets them to focus, refocus on doing something about it. Remember, you are not the savior here. I don't know if you know anything about the drama triangle, where there's a victim, where the triangle is like this, where there's a victim and they choose the savior for them to save them and they detest the perpetrator. That's the triangle, but they're always the victim. They're always the victim. So try and avoid these sorts of scenarios where you are the savior except for children, except for where, where people are dependent upon you. Okay, well, let me sort that out. But even there, you have to be helping them to help themselves. You know, the old saying, try and help them to help themselves. What would you do then? What do you think is the best next step? Or simply, how do you think I can help you here? Can be a simple question. How, what do you think? Those kinds of questions. Ask them what helps, what helps you most, what helps them most. <coughs> yeah, what, what would help you most? Allow them, allow, permit them to think for themselves. When you start thinking, you move out, you, you move away from your emotions. Your emotions, when you're emotionally hijacked, when you're stressed, you move away from your thinking. <laughs> you don't think straightly. When I'm stressed, I don't know where my keys are. They're right in front of me. You know, we don't know where our, our, our glasses are. They're right on top of our head. Yeah? When we're stressed, we don't think clearly. We're hijacked by our limbic brain. So we want to move into the, um, into the frontal cortex, the neocortex, and we do that by asking questions. Good questions, open questions. I know I'm likely to experience an unwanted emotion in particular um, circumstance. What techniques can I use to lessen the likelihood of it happening? An unwanted emotion. So the way I try to define emotions, that emotions are just pieces of data. They're data in formation, information. And what we want to do to it is embrace it. Embrace emotions. Don't run away from them. Or stand there, face them. And if these emotions are welling up in you, check it. Okay. Ooh, that's a heavy one. And then when you feel that you've had enough, step back. Look, um, can we have this? Can we continue this con conversation at another time? It seems like, conclude. It seems like we're not really getting, I guess, the, the results that we're looking for, you know, respectively. Um, and I, it seems like this conversation needs to continue much longer. Can we agree to continue the conversation tomorrow? another time can we make an appointment for it that way you're giving the other person security you're recognizing the situation oh this is a really difficult situation and we and it needs more time the situation requires more time and that we don't have that time or at least you don't have that time and then a question can we agree to and then you come back with the same question if, if they haven't heard you yeah Good point. What do you do when people as types continue to hijack you, kind of dumping their emotions on you? Well, look, it's also, um, okay, my first reaction is protect yourself somehow. But um, that's a knee jerk reaction. But kind of dumping their emotions on you, you can say, well, look, for example, I mean, I've had this as well, you know, family life, etc. There's urgencies all the time. 
um, but what you're doing is important too. So you can say something like, you're having a hard time, Lynn. Yeah, right? Or it seems like it's really tough right now. Right? You can, you can say things like that. You can, you can say things like, um, it seems like, or it sounds like, this is coming back to Chris Voss. This is tactical empathy. It seems like you're having a hard time there and you want my attention. And what you're looking for is the yes, not a verbal yes necessarily, but a yes, them thinking, yeah, that's right. Okay. Secondly, you add in at the same time, at the same time, not but, at the same time. So you present them with a dilemma. You're, you, you really want my attention. You want me to listen to you. You want me to hear you out. You're very frustrated. It seems, it seems like you're very frustrated and you want to tell me all about it. And at the same time, I have a lot to do right now. Right now, at this moment, I've got lots of other things that I need to look at and that need my attention. Will it be possible? Can we agree to... <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're moving them out of their emotional state by saying what they have. Yeah. Be careful with this. We don't want to say you're angry or you're being aggressive or you are, um, you want my attention. Mm -mm. It seems like that whatever you're speaking about is very important for you and that you need to speak about it to, to get it off your chest. And at the same time, there are other responsibilities that I have at this time. And I need to look, I need to just, I need to give that a priority. Or you can say something which perhaps is a little bit better. You have this and this and this. And I want to, I want to give you that time and focus. I don't want to be dividing my focus when it comes to this issue that you're talking about. Can we look at a time tomorrow or later on this week where we can really sit down with a cup of coffee and talk about this. Is that possible? And wait for their answer. So we have a question. What yeah. do you do when people as types continue to hijack you? Kind of damping their emotion in you? Just like I said, um, in the same way. You want to be eloquent about it. I mean, of course, you know, by all means, okay, perhaps if the person is, you know, not listening to you, then you just have to find ways to strategies to move away from that person. If that person happens to be a member of the family, then we're talking about gratitude. We're talking about um, um, loving that person and choosing the people that you want to converse with and speak to like a member of the family you know like a parent or something you know someone who's happens to be um less than interesting conversations and you uh, find that um you feel perhaps take you know you feel the, the energy has been drained by listening to them then you want to just focus on loving them Okay, fair enough. And work a way out of it and then, and then choose people. Choose people that you want to be with that inspire you. And make sure that you have them <laughs> on speed dial if you need. You know, make sure that you can resource yourself. Yeah. I only have two friends like that. But I have interesting conversations with everyone generally. But two friends where I, where I can lay it down and we give each other time. And they call me, I pick the phone up. Okay, good. Um, I see we're going over time. I just want to quickly finish with one, one or two, perhaps more um, uh, skills. We talked about reforming, reformulating what they say, physically, vocally, mm -hmm, you know, um, and verbally. So with the body language, you're focused on them, you're listening to them, you're paying, you're paying attention literally you're paying attention reformulating what they say but also saying wow 
empathically, it seems like it's, uh, it looks like it's a, you have a difficult time. You have a really challenging time here. It sounds like, it feels like, you know, you don't want to judge anything. You don't want to say, well, you should do this or you're right or they're right. No, don't get into that. You want to stay distant from that and protect yourself. That's another way of protecting yourself. And then there's the desk method. I don't know if you know the desk method. Maybe we'll close now and then we'll do the desk method. Um, push it on to tomorrow to finish up. You probably know this already. You probably learned it already. But it's, it's just what I've been doing. Basically describing the situation that they would say yes to. So their relative facts. Describing the dilemma or the feelings that it provokes in you. Coming up with a, a question, a solution. Can we do this later? Can we continue this later? Gives them all the reason to, yeah, wow, we're going to be continuing something. Okay, great. That's what I want. Yeah. And then conclude. If they say, look, no, I want to speak about it now. I say, well, look, it seems like uh, you have a lot to say and I have a lot to do. And uh, let's just conclude now because I don't feel that, uh, that we're respecting each other which is, can be a relative truth because you don't feel respected. And perhaps they don't feel respected either because they don't, you're, you're not listening to them as, you, as they want you to. Does that make sense? Is that, is that palpable? Yes. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Be honest. Be honest. This is something that you have to practice. You have to be in a state, a physiological state. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Aifa. Uh, okay. Thumbs up, everyone. Tudor. Everana. Everana. Okay. 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 If there was a question, we're going to go right into question time now. If there was a question that you'd like to ask Great. regarding this. Or maybe, Maria, you want to perhaps close first and then go into question time. Yeah, no, no, you can continue, Susan. Go okay. ahead. So um, if there was a question that you would like to uh, ask uh, regarding communication when the person is in front of you, you know, um, please go ahead. You know, just um, you know, write it in the chat or unmute yourselves. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. At the same time, honestly, it is difficult for me to do it with a with a very close member of my family. True. True. Very challenging. Very very challenging. Then get the June recording. <laughs> we talk about gratitude and 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 what you can do by yourself in front of the person or not, but it has nothing to do with the person. You don't interact with the person. You can just be there. And you can affirm things for yourself. And then we're, we are allowing ourselves to be in another state, another, another frequency with our brain, the alpha brain waves. And then with the, with the, um, with the hope that it, it would transfer. You know? um, how to tackle very negative colleagues that complains about everything. <coughs> Excuse me. In the same way. Oh, well, let's see. They complain about everything. Well, what do you want? That's the first question. Neg negative person. Yeah, a negative person who complains, that complains All about everything. So what, what do you want out of the conversation? What do you want with that person? That's the first question to answer for yourself. What do I want with this? What do I want for me? And what do I want for that person? That I have this, they're coming to me again for some reason. What do I want? Answer that question first. For you, perhaps it's very easy. What do you want for them? So if, you're, if, if what you wanted was a gift that you, could, that, you could, that you could give them, what would it be? Christine. That's for you. Okay, stay away. Positiveness. Okay, you want to give them positiveness. Okay. That's a tricky, um, that's a tricky uh, objective. Yeah. I would want, for example, for that person to feel that they, I would want them to feel happy. Okay, maybe it's the same thing. Okay, that's fine. That's the first step. Second step is, how do you do it? 
And I would say always respect yourself first. Respect yourself first and foremost. And then go about helping others. If you don't have the ability, the time, the patience, the state of mind, you're going to crumble. Don't even enter into a conversation. Respect yourself first. What you need, what you need, a glass of water, what you need physically, what you need, you know, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, what do you need? And when you don't have the resources to deal with the challenging people mentally, e.g. mentally disturbed, or you get help, you ask for help. Does the person know that they are mentally disturbed? Do they, are they aware of it? Does your boss know? You, you ask for help. You literally ask for help. Because then you're not speaking to someone who has perhaps all their cognitive faculties with them. And you need more of a professional, an expert who can deal with that. We can't do everything. And don't put that on your shoulders. It's not your responsibility. What do I want for myself out of this conversation? What do I want to give the other person? And do I feel, am I, am I ready to engage? Am I ready to, am I feeling ready to, to listen at least? And then give that 100% of listening. Give that. And over time, it may not happen immediately. Over time, they'll, they'll you know, they'll, wow, thank you so much for just being there. You're the only one that does this. But don't let it be something whereby you are the, en français, on the bouc émissaire. Uh, you are the person that always has to um, be drained. Protect yourself. I mean, you know, make sure that you are able to define your limits. That's what I'm talking about. Amy, no, her name is um, <coughs> Brenny Brown. Brenny Brown, I forgot the book now. Um, Brenny, Brené, Brené, B-R-E-N-E, Brown. Um, oh, I, forgot, I forgot the name of the book. But it's a very good book um, about um, vulnerability. Daring greatly. There it is. Daring greatly. Um, define your limits. Dare greatly. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is what I'm permitting myself to have. These are the resources that I'm, I haven't been permitting myself by not defining my limits. Let me define them. Let me be courageous. And define those limits and, and, and then from there, let me try and use this empathy thing that Leonard tries to talk about. Yeah, defining your limits is very important. Often we, because of being good, you know, culture, we let ourselves, um, we let our toes be trodden on. And we're not, we're there for others, but not including ourselves. And so the idea is be there for yourself. You're the only person that's going to help yourself. Yeah. No one else. Other people will perhaps, but you know, not like you want to be helped. And allow people to do the same for themselves too. Sometimes it's just a matter of just putting that limit down. Although perhaps it's not, perhaps, you know, someone may say it's not culturally acceptable. It's not, you know, whatever, it's impolite. No, you know, like they say on the airplane, put the mask on yourself first. They say it for a reason. You can't help anyone if you're suffering. Any other questions? Any other thoughts, comments, criticisms, uh, additions, contributions? Today we talked about contributing, or rather, how do we encourage, support, um, encourage, create um, supportive relationships? And we went through this idea of being aware of one's own emotions. Don't just put it under the table. Let it come up slowly progressively and then of course dealing with the person in front of you and how we can through empathic ways of behaving with our voice our words and our posture and of course words that we would simply slip in between their lines okay um you know repeat what they say reformulate it seems like you're having a hard time meaning that they have a responsibility what would you do next? Redirecting them to use their more neocortex part of their brain. And so they can start thinking about what they want to do. And then saying at the end, look, maybe we should continue this conversation another time. 
Can we do that? And doing that. Thank you very much, everyone. We're over time. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, tomorrow it will be better. Good. I'm glad it's helpful. Um, I guess this is also part of the key of being resourceful. Yeah. Good. Have a good evening. Um, have a good meal. And we'll see each other tomorrow at 4.30 for those of us who can make it.